First question, email. <clears throat> You've talked about loving as much as you're able. Uh, not more, because if you try to give more, you'll empty out. Mm, yep, I have. I've talked about that on many occasions. Really important principle, because people will abuse you uh, with an obligation to love them more. And especially if they know you know about real love, they'll say, wow, if you're unconditionally loving, you'd give me what I want. No, that's not true. Um, you continue. But aren't there sometimes you just have to suck it up? Uh, I remember one time I was at your house, and I was going out for dinner with you and Donna. But then another person came to the driveway as we were about to go, and you just had to accept that she was coming with us, even though you had told me you just wanted to take, to take me out with you two. That is a great example uh, and great questions because these kinds of things happen a lot. So let's look at the ways that this could happen. Um, let's look at the bad way. Um, <clears throat> I would feel obligated to take her out with me, uh, with us. Um, I feel guilty, so I take her because, well, <sighs> I kind of have to. Um, wrong. That's a terrible way to live. And I didn't do that. Um, a good way. I do have the energy uh, to take her. It won't kill me. Um, I'd prefer uh, to have just gone with you, but mm, it's really not going to bother me. I really could refuse and live with it. And I do that. So I don't ever feel trapped. So if somebody comes up and says, well, can we, can, can we go out to dinner? And I go, uh, uh, no, not this time. And I don't explain it. Um, they can be offended or not, but that's not my responsibility. But I could see that the price to her would be pretty painful. So let's make this up. Uh, I don't do this kind of cost analysis, literally. But if I'd said, no, you can't go to dinner with this, and it would have hurt her at a seven, and to take her would be uncomfortable to me at a two or three. Mm, that's just not all that difficult math. So, yeah, I'm willing to be uncomfortable at a two. It's a cost-benefit cost analysis. So I choose to take her, uh, which I did. I sucked it up, as you say, but because I wanted to, not because I felt obligated to. You continue. Something like this has happened to me today, and I didn't see any other way than to just accept it, even though I feel resistance. I've been teaching a parenting class, and just an hour before the class, one of the women called and said that she couldn't get a babysitter. So she would need to bring her two kids. And she said, they'll, they'll play quietly in the next room. <laughs> If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. You said, I felt trapped. So I said, sure, because you were naive. Uh, you said, but I was irritated. So there are two things going on here. Let's separate them, because we tend to lump things together and get them confused. First, you have to give only what you're able. If you keep giving past that, you lose big. You understand that principle. You've already, you've already stated it. And second... There's a reason for guidelines for things like real love meetings or parenting classes or whatever. The guidelines are not to limit people's behavior. They're to increase the love that can be given and received. It's always about the love. It's not about rules. So let's take the kids, for example. I've experimented with a lot of things in real love groups, classes, seminars, tried just about everything. And I've discovered that it's really pretty important to provide an environment that is safe, peaceful, and loving. Now listen to this rest part, the rest of it. For the greatest possible number of people. You can't cater to every individual need. We've learned that people in a group simply cannot pay attention if there is a child in the room or even outside the room or a dog in the room. It's a law. It's impossible. So I don't ever allow people's children in any real love event or pets. Never, ever. Because it's the most loving thing for the most number of people. Not because I don't like kids. I like kids. Uh, or I don't like dogs. like dogs. Uh, but nope, not at a real love seminar or a parenting class. So what do you say? 
often we feel trapped because we've never said no. So you say, I'm just giving you an example. It didn't have to be this. I'm so sorry you couldn't get a babysitter. But having a child at a group is just too distracting. Oh, they'll be very quiet in the next room. Yeah, we've experimented with that. And it just really never works out because you can't control the behavior of a child. You can't. It's impossible. They're kids. Um, nor a pet. So it's too distracting for you and for others. They don't stay quiet in the next room. They make noise. Kids are supposed to make noise. They're kids. So I'll miss you this week, but I look forward to seeing you next week. Poof. See how positive it is? It's the kids can't come, but we really look forward to seeing you in a week. Well, but, but, but then you just repeat whatever part of what I just said will eventually get across, but you don't argue. So when somebody says, well, are you saying that I don't have any control over my children? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't fall for the victim trap. You just say, it's been my experience that people are just too distracted by children. See, you don't make it about their kids. Uh, don't argue. Here's a letter from a lady who says, my older sister <clears throat> was offended by something that happened with me and my other siblings over a year ago. I, after the event was over, she, she complained to me about what had happened. I heard her out. I listened to everything. Um, I was quiet. I told her that we had not been as thoughtful as we could have been toward her. I said I was sorry. I tried my best to love her. And no matter what I said, it wasn't what she wanted to hear. So tonight she called me and she said that she wants to get together with my other siblings and hash out the same old event, which I don't want to do. And I know she's empty and afraid and I know it's not going to go well. So what do I do? Again, it's about love. It's about actually the principle we've already been talking about. Don't give more, give more than you can. You've already listened to her. She has, unfortunately, as victims do, she's defined listening as giving her what she wants. That's what all victims do. That's how they stay victims. They don't really want to be listened to. No, they want you to agree with them and give them what they want, which makes people deaf. So now she wants to try to persuade you again to give her what she wants or agree with her. There's no yield. Um, no matter what you say, she's not going to be happy unless you betray yourself. Um, you're not going to enjoy the event. So let's see, that'd be a score of zero for her, zero for you. Don't go. Really, don't go. So when she says, well, I want all everybody to get together, you say, I have somewhere else to be. Um, you don't have to say, um, I'm going to be watching the grass grow in my backyard. Um, I have somewhere else to be. Home. Uh, sometimes that can be easier for people to hear than, um, you know, I'd rather stick a flaming hot sword down my throat than attend this meeting. So tell the truth, but you don't always have to tell all of it because uh, it can be just cruel. A woman wrote me an email. She said, I'm just not that in love with my husband, Mark. Uh, I wonder if I ever will love him. Everybody tells me I'm wrong, that he's a great guy, so why wouldn't I love him? Oh, honey, that is such terrible advice you're getting from people. It is the wrong approach. Notice what they're saying. They're telling you that because he's a great guy, you should love him, that you have plenty of reasons to love him. Well, baby, they just defined conditional love. Wrong. So, then now I'm talking to the audience, uh, to those of you who are watching the, the video. She then sent me another email. I can't remember if it was an email or a text and admitted that, yeah, she's always looking for what she can get from her husband. So let me continue. So instead of looking for reasons to love him or asking yourself if you love him, do this. The real question is whether you will choose to love him. So an entirely different approach. The one is conditional, the other is unconditional. You love him freely and unconditionally. So after I said that, she wrote back. Uh, I guess I'm afraid that if I do that, love him freely and unconditionally, I'm going to lose myself. 
oh, that's very insightful. Very few people have the insight to realize that that's what they're afraid of. And it's a reasonable fear because as a child, you did experiment with being open and vulnerable. And what happened? You did lose yourself. Really, you were consumed by your parents and others who essentially took you prisoner or hostage and made you into what they wanted. So you, you have done this experiment with loving freely. People used you. You lost yourself. As a young adult, you tried again, probably the first two or three times that you fell in love. Um, and again, whoever you fell in love with tried to make you into what they wanted. So you lost yourself again. So I get your fear. Really reasonable. But this is different. You're married to this guy. You have people in real love who can love you unconditionally. So this isn't like your childhood or your adolescence at all. So what am I suggesting? Try again. Um, and try smarter. And remember what you have. You know more than you knew before. You have more than you had before. So again, just give freely and give as much as you can. That's what? The third time in one video chat, we've talked about that same principle. Accident? Don't know. If you remember both of those, freely and as much as you can, you can't lose yourself. It's people who try to give more than they can who lose themselves. If you give everything that somebody wants, then you will lose yourself because they'll just eat you up. They'll just use you. Uh, or you'll get resentful. So just do it. Give him all you got, all you can give freely. Trust him that he won't try to steal your soul, figuratively speaking, and trust yourself that you're smarter and you got more, you got more assets, resources. Here's somebody who says, uh, I was listening last night to one of your boot camp DVDs, and I heard you say that you were concerned more for those people who had been trained to be good, you know, the good boy, the good girl, than those who were a little rebellious because the good kids had all their creativity stifled. I'm not entirely sure why, but today I feel really touchy and afraid because I identified with that childhood situation and I felt like I had been trained to be nice all my life and as a result, I had given up who I really was. And in addition to becoming nice, I had also learned to be boring. I had become, now I'm paraphrasing because she went on a little bit longer, boring in the sense that uh, she had no individuality, no sense of creativity. And you know, when you're a people pleaser, you do give up your individuality. You give up pretty much all your creativity because you only have one goal, which is to please the people around you. And they define what pleasing them is. Do you see? So where's you in that? Where's your creativity? Where's you being an individual? Oh, it's, it's gone. You continue. That's with my little aside, sorry. Uh, so now I understand why, but despite three years of being in real love, nothing's changed. I'm still lacking in creativity and possibly always will be which I equate with meaning lacking in personality. I know intellectually that it doesn't make me unlovable, but I feel as if that was what you were saying and that I've gone into fear that I'm just this boring blob and there's no hope for me. Today, I just feel like I want to curl up and die. Well, good for you. Curl up and die doesn't sound like a positive thing to say or something for me to be happy about, but. This is actually very cool because you're waking up, no kidding, from decades old nap. You're becoming less fearful by a lot. That's a start. And now you're sufficiently fearless that you're beginning to see yourself in principles that you would have just passed over before. So how do you get a personality now? In the first place, you've seen that you don't really know whether you have one. That's a great start. Doesn't sound real positive, but it is. 
now you start to take chances. So now, instead of doing what makes other people happy, instead of doing what minimizes pain, you take chances, which I've seen you do. I've seen you do it in conversations with me. I've seen you do it in conversations with other people. I've seen you do it in some of the stuff that you've posted on Facebook, where you're taking chances and saying things where people might not like you. That's how you develop a personality. And you'll begin to do more and more of that. Things that come from you, your personality, your creativity, instead of responding only to your fear. Responding to fear is fairly monotonous. Once people are afraid enough, you can really kind of predict what they're going to do. When I have people here for interventions, sometimes after five minutes, I'll just describe their life to them. I'll say, here's how you've lived. Here's how you've responded to your mother and your father and your sister, and here's how you are at work. And people will say, how did you know all that? Because people who are afraid are boring. Really. Uh, I stab you in the leg with a fork. And what are you going to do? Um, you're not going to sing a song. You're not going to play the piano. Um, you're not going to go out and do the, the, the highest form of artistic achievement, which would be to use a chainsaw or smooth concrete. Um, no, when you're stabbed in the leg with a fork, you just scream or move your leg or stand up or the, the options are really limited. When you're not afraid, you're going to start to be you. And you're going to find this is really fun. Uh, you're going to let go of your thinking and just jump into stuff and not worry about how it's going to look. You've been held down by tentacles of fear far longer than you realized and far more. That's all. So I'm really happy for you. This is really cool. It's going to be fun to watch. Um, I've been talking to a woman by email and by phone. I'm going to summarize this because it's a lot of emails and phone calls, whose mother uh, has been living with her for the last, I don't, can't remember, six months, something like that. Her mother's a controlling, whiny victim who just goes on and on constantly, uh, constantly fussing about how things are not quite right, uh, uh, constantly whining that things are not the way that she wants, and then acting like a little baby and apologizing for existing. Um, victims, like I said, people in pain are fairly predictable. And it finally became time for the mother to leave. Time to go back to where she was in the first place. And in her last few days, she would walk around the house saying things like, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Victims even have the same expressions. <laughs> there should be a separate language, you know, English, Spanish, you know, uh, Slovakian victim. Um, she said, well, now I guess I just won't be a bother to anybody. <laughs> or she'd pat her grandchild on the head and go, I'll probably never see this child again. <laughs> Victims are a constant stand-up comedy act. Um, and the lady that I've been talking to was didn't know what to do with all this victimhood. And I said, honey, you've dealt with it all this time. Just let it go. You have loved her as well as you could. Just keep loving her as well as you can in the days to come. It will never be enough. So you don't ever have to wonder, how should I love her so that it will work? There is no way. That's how victims have defined it. Victims will reach in and suck your soul out of you and then just ask you how come you don't have another one. So they're never done. They're never happy. Uh, just accept that, that, you, that you've loved her as well as you could and that it was a loving experience for you, even if it wasn't for her. You can't control that part. Um, here's a member who says, uh, I had both my grandkids staying over last weekend. That was last weekend. So I decided that this weekend um, I would have it to myself. When their mother, my daughter, Sinead, uh, came to pick up the kids on Sunday, uh, that was last weekend. She asked me if I was ready to have both grandkids again next weekend, the weekend I had decided to be by myself. She said that she and her partner were going to go away for a short break, a little, uh, we call it vacation, they call it holiday, um, to celebrate his passing his exams a couple of weeks ago. 
I told her I had other plans and wouldn't be available to take care of the grandkids. <clears throat> she said, well, but, but I asked you weeks ago and, and you said that you would. But she didn't and I hadn't agreed. This is a very clever trick used by many victims. And in their defense, I really think they don't realize they do it most of the time. They, they create a scenario. We've all done this. We've, we've all done things like thought, you know, I really need to mail a letter to somebody. I really need to go to the post office. I've done this. I've actually completed writing the letter, putting a stamp on the envelope and taking it to the post office in my head so that I would remember to do it. And then later, I created the plan so thoroughly in my head, I couldn't remember if I'd actually done it. And I think victims do this all the time. Actually, I know they do it all the time. I'm just defending them and saying I most of the time think they don't realize it. So they create the optimal behavior in their head, and then later, that turns into a memory that they actually did it, and they believe it, because it would all make sense. So she says to you, well, yeah, I talked to you about that, because she knows she should have. And you said yes, because she wanted you to have said yes, and it would make you feel obligated. I get this a lot. People say to me, but you said, and then they tell me what I said. Now, sometimes I go, maybe I did. I don't trust my memory much anymore. But sometimes they tell me that I said things that, you know, words that could not possibly have come out of my mouth. So I know they're making it up. You know, like you just, last week you were talking about the blue cauliflower growing in your window. Impossible. So I know I didn't say that. Victims do it a lot, make up stuff that they wanted to have happened. You continue. She asked me what I was doing. Uh, as opposed to taking care of her kids. I didn't answer that one as I knew where it would go. I just replied that it didn't matter what I was doing. I had plans and wouldn't be available. Oh, honey, a kiss on both your cheeks. Good for you. We way over explain ourselves to people, which really is a way of justifying our existence. That's what we're doing. We're justifying our worthiness. Remember this. People who demand explanations are never satisfied with them. People who care about you don't need one. So why bother to offer them? It's a waste of time, really is. You said she didn't let it go. Uh, gee, surprising. Uh, during her stay, while she was there at our house uh, for the remainder of the evening, anytime she got an opportunity to beg me, she did. She tried to bribe me with money. She offered me 10 pounds. This is somebody who works in that incredibly archaic British monetary system. Um, she must think that I'm very cheap. <laughs> she told me that nobody else was available. She told me that the hotel was already booked. Manipulators are masters, aren't they? I mean, they're really good. <clears throat> Which is why they usually get what they want, because they're good at it. And why they keep doing it the next time because they do get what they want. Unwittingly, we're trying to be nice, and what we really succeed in doing is just enabling them. We just reward them for their manipulation, and so we actually train them, like you would train a dog or a seal, to manipulate us the next time. Kind of stupid on our part. Um, you continue, she told me, this one made me laugh, it's good to be needed. <laughs> I've heard all these. I love them. <laughs> she said, you like to be needed. Everyone likes to be needed. <laughs> you say, I told her, no, actually, I don't like to be needed. I really don't. It's a very clever trap. Being needed is unavoidable. Um, if you're a parent, your children need you. But liking it, needing to be needed, oh, that's a real trap. Because um, then you'll start doing things like making sure that you're needed. Like the 72-year-old lady who called me to complain that her 45-year-old son was still living with her at home. And she described this more and more, complained about his being there. But the more she talked, I said, Honey, you like it that he's there. No, I don't. 
Oh, I said, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. You love it that he's there. You love it that you're important. You like taking care of him. It gives you a role in life. It makes you feel valued. And you have the added bonus of getting all that. And you like to complain about it. So you just win no matter what happens. You've done everything possible to keep him there. In fact, every time this guy would make a move to leave his mama's house, um, she would make it essentially irresistible to stay. She virtually paid him to stay there. You continue. Mostly, I replied no when she kept asking me, uh, or I said nothing at all. I was just uh, continuing what I was doing, you know, sewing or whatever you're doing, or using your chainsaw in the living room. By the time they were going, she was really getting serious. She tried guilt tactics by telling me, well, I guess I'll have to cancel the hotel. <laughs> I told her that she'd figure out what she needed to do. The last thing she said to me going out the door was that you have until Wednesday before I cancel the hotel. <laughs> so I said to her, oh, well, we won't need to wait, wait till Wednesday because my answer is still no. <laughs> Great manipulators can hardly believe that no is a possibility. They're just too good at it. And in their defense, we've enabled them. We've trained them to manipulate. So once we change the rules and we're not manipulatable, it's kind of disorienting to them. They, they don't know what to do. You said, I didn't feel bad or feel fearful with her asking me. Uh, I just saw what our relationship has been um, and what it can be like. I used to get annoyed and frustrated and then eventually give in, but I wasn't the least bit uncomfortable. I just wasn't willing to do it. Beautiful. Last night you said I received a message telling me that she'd canceled the hotel and that she was going to get her hair done instead. <laughs> so, would I mind watching the kids for a couple of hours? <laughs> She's good. <laughs> she gave me all the reasons why. Her partner's working, the other grandparents away. Now, here I'm not sure, you say. I did tell her I had plans, and yet I feel like I'm constantly saying no to her all the time. Um, but she's always in some kind of crisis where she requires my help. So if I do say yes, I know it's going to be longer than the two hours she's talking about. It's going to turn into half a day. But I feel bad for not wanting to do it because she's going to feel like, like I'm telling her no all the time. If I do it, I also am going to feel bad because I'm enabling her. So. I'm getting emotional about this. I don't know what to do. <clears throat> Quit overthinking this. Oddly, the same principle keeps coming up over and over in this particular chat. Decide what you want to do. What do you want? Forget about the enabling and all that stuff. No, th this is about you. Uh, right now, you're not in a position of being her coach and her teacher. Got it? So, forget the enabling. Ask yourself, what do you want to do? And what are you able to do? And make your decision from that. Worry about teaching her later. She's an adult child. That's going to be way later. Uh, she isn't in the mood to learn your lesson anyway. You're going to find, you're going to be able to make your decision like that when you take away the teaching part. Here's an um, email from a woman uh, who just had an intervention, I don't know, weeks ago. I don't, however many. She said, <clears throat> I still feel so loved. I just want to share with you the truth about myself that I saw this past weekend. Um, I think of it really as my freedom list. This is the list of crap that I'm now free from as long as I stay feeling loved. I'm now free from the following self-inflicted victimhood misery. Addiction to pain, whining, legalistically arguing details, that's a subtle little thing for a victim to pick up on, let me tell you. Repeating what I say over and over until others just agree to get it to stop. Whoa, I mean, this is great insight. Constantly looking for opportunities to be offended. Seeking power, control, and dominion over others. Seeking sympathy, focusing on what I don't get instead of what I do. Living in my imaginary world where everybody else is getting what was supposed to be mine. I'm, 
I'm floating now. I mean, this is, this is such cool stuff to read. Feeling anxiety, making others loving actions, interactions with me impersonal and impossible. Feeling invisible, she said, I feel like I'm living on another planet. It's a little disorienting. Like, now what? Like, who am I? I love feeling loved. I'm feeling so grateful. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. I mean, this is really great stuff to get, to read. Only days before this, she was whining and complaining and everything was black and the world was terrible and nobody was nice to her and uh, the sun was tilted wrong and everything was bad. And I finally just went through the phone and said, honey, you're choosing to be miserable. Because here, here's the truth. Here's the truth about everything going on in your life, both difficult and not difficult, loving and un. And I said, and you get to see the whole truth with all the good things, or you can focus just on the darkness. So when the sun goes down, you could choose to say, the world is over. There will be no more light. I think I just as well kill myself, which is what victims do. Or you could say, hmm, well, sun's going to be down for a few hours. Uh, I guess I could turn on the light switch um, and the sun will be up tomorrow. Poof, not complicated. She listened. She listened. She chose to listen. She chose to be happy. We really get to choose. No kidding. How do I know? She did. And I've seen many other people do the same thing. So many people have said to me, you know, you say this, Happiness is a choice thing, and I just don't see it. Well, there it is, right in front of you. I just gave you an example of it. And she was just about as miserable and whiny just a few days before as you could possibly be. I think I just knocked the camera completely off its axis. I did. I reached out with my foot and, you know, just casually just kicked it away, you know. I moved one of the legs, I think this one. Yeah, it'll do, you know. We'll fix it next time. I was a bad person. This writer says, uh, My father doesn't hesitate to ask me questions about our financial business, like, how much did you pay for that? Or what are they charging you for that? Or what's your interest rate? Or how much do you owe on whatever? I wouldn't mind answering him except for the fact that he is very secretive about his finances with me, though not with my brother. Oh, honey, you're missing the point. It's not about whether he shares financial stuff with you. It's not about the trading, because that's what you're talking about. The point is, you simply have no obligation to share any of this with him because you're an adult. You don't have to tell him how you spend your money. It's the obligation. That is the point. You're not obligated. We are so thoroughly taught by our parents that we have to tell them everything. We were taught that from the time we were born. And many parents continue to badger their children to share everything when they're adults. You walk in, adult children walk into their parents' houses and the, ch and the parent grill them. So how's school? How are your grades? What are you making? Are you putting... Uh, my father, who's almost 90 now, still, in most phone conversations, still asks me how much money I'm saving in the bank for my retirement. <laughs> so, hoping that he isn't watching this, uh, <laughs> I just make up a number. Oh, Dad, I have $35 million in one bank and 25... I, and he's, he's just thrilled with my answer and moves on to the next question. He means well, he really does. Be, but we're just not obligated to answer those questions. You continue. He's also done very well financially. Uh, I know this because my mother, who's deceased, and my brother have discussed this with me. I would assume if your mother's deceased, it wasn't recently. <laughs> I'm going to get letters about that. Uh, I don't owe him any money, and he isn't contributing my financial life in any way, so he has no investment to uh, oversee by knowing our business. When he asks me these types of questions, I act like a victim, and I answer him, and I hate it. See, we're back to the point. Guilt and obligation. 
we give into guilt and obligation. We were trained to. But then we hate it. And that's how you know it's wrong. If you hate it, and there's something wrong with this picture. Here's a man who says, uh, I have a real problem with commitment. Oh, I haven't told the Sylvie story. I'm going to look one up. Hang on a second. This is called lack of preparation. And apparently I cannot spell my granddaughter's name. But since I can knock the computer over, I'd just as well do my research right here on the screen, on camera. Here we are. Bruce, age two. I'm going to be reading this live. I haven't prepared it, so who knows what it's going to say. Uh, Bruce was age two, and he woke up grumpy from his nap. And Sylvie, um, age three, was on the bed coloring in a coloring book. She could hear her dad asking Bruce what would make him happy. Do you want a toy? His dad said. Are you thirsty? Uh, are you hungry? Would you like to watch a television show? Would you like a bath? And eventually he said, and Bruce said no to all these things. And eventually he said to Bruce, would you like a hug with dad? And Bruce said, yeah. At that point, Sylvie looked up from the book that she was reading and said, well, bless your heart, Brucey. <laughs> this girl just cracks me up endlessly. Um, uh, here's another one. I'm going to read you two in a row because I'm having a good time. Um, one time, Sylvie was rolling out some Play-Doh and using a bunny cookie cutter. Who doesn't have one of those, right? Chainsaw and a bunny cookie cutter. Um, to make some little cutouts of bunnies. And Bruce, too, swoops in, as two-year-old boys do, and starts smashing the little play bunnies. Well, you could imagine, in most families, this would just result in screaming and hitting and throwing and yelling, and in comes mom and has to break it up. Um, but uh, Jeanette goes. She says, at first, um, Sylvie was frust frustrated at Bruce because she he just destroyed her work. And then... She turned back to what she was doing, calmly rolled out some more Play-Doh, and made some bunnies specifically for Bruce to destroy, and then went on making bunnies for herself. I've only just barely begun to figure out solutions like that after 60 years, and she's got it figured out at age three. Love that kid. So much smarter than I. Here's a man who says, I have a real problem with commitment. Uh, I can't commit to relationships. I can't even commit to individual decisions. They paralyze me. I wish I knew where this fear comes from. Could be my mother's unreliability when I was a baby. She came and went and left me for six months or longer when I was about a year old. And then she lied and told me that I was adopted when she was actually my real mother. <laughs> We used to do that to my brother all the time. <laughs> We'd say, you know, you're adopted. My, my uh, brother is 15 months younger, and I used to say this to our much younger brother. And he'd say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ask mom. And we'd say, go ahead and ask her. But what she's going to say is, they're just teasing you. You're not adopted. So he'd run into the next room and say, Reed and Greg said I'm adopted. And she'd say, exactly what we said. They're just teasing you. You're not really adopted. And he, then he'd burst into tears and he'd say, they told me you'd say that to me. <laughs> we, but we did it in a really kind way. <laughs> so back to your question. Your mother told you that uh, you were adopted when you weren't. She abandoned you for six months. This is really popular psychological stuff. Um, psychology and self-help stuff, but, but it's a red herring. It's a distraction. Psychologists love to point to individual dramatic events as the cause of lifelong patterns of behavior, like rape, abandonment as a child, sickness, death. We love finding clever little associations. Um, why is it that I'm afraid of 
whatever, um, orange juice, because when I was a child, my mother once suffocated me with half a cantaloupe. We love these little, because they were both orange, you see, and almost never are these associations significant. They're indications of whether a child felt loved. That's all. Your mother went in and out and left you and abandoned you. She was telling you she didn't care about you. You didn't feel loved. Your life has been one long series of disappointments and not feeling loved, an unending string of pain. So why in the world would you want to make decisions or commit to relationships when the results in the past have invariably been painful? You wouldn't. You're actually smart. You've learned from past experience what hurts, so now you avoid it. I had a good friend who was a brilliant physician. Um, he just couldn't keep up with his paperwork. His medical license would regularly lapse, his malpractice insurance, and he said, I just don't understand why. Because nothing in your life has ever made you happy, so you've just given up doing stuff. You continue. Sometimes women ask me why... Um, oh, sorry, this is me. <laughs> this is me writing to myself. Um, sometimes women ask me why men are afraid of commitment. And I tell them it's because men are smarter. Um, they're not particularly fond of that answer. Um, women are very optimistic. Th they'll fail in one relationship after another and go, well, let's see now, in the next one, I will change him in this way. They can always think of a way to make it better. I'm joking, but it's all about pain. Men are more diligent about avoiding pain. They've never found a relationship that's really produced love and happiness. So they don't make commitments to love and relationships because they're they just eventually give up. Whereas women try to control the relationships to diminish their pain. Men just run away from them. Regardless of that, you said, I want to change my attitude now for I see the advantages of commitment as you describe it in your books. But I don't know what I would do if I were now faced with a commitment situation such as marriage. Faced with big decisions, I become afraid. Well, then honey, don't make big decisions right now. You don't need to worry about big decisions. You certainly don't need to worry about getting married. Just decide to trust one person to love you. Start there. Trust one person, one wise person in your group, one coach, anything. Commit, and, and if you can do that, then commitments to anything else become much easier. And the big commitments come a whole lot later. So lighten up. Take the little steps. You said, I think that I have to confront my woundedness around commitment and heal it. Mm, not really around commitment. You just need to face your woundedness. Because you're wounded everywhere. Which is why if you trust just one person, you'll begin to heal everywhere. And as your woundedness heals, commitment becomes relatively easy. You said, what can I do? I've worked on this topic in therapy before uh, I was in relationships, and I wanted to escape or felt the fear of commitment, but I've never really healed the core issue. Uh, therapy has a terrible rate of success. Terrible. There are now dozens of well-regarded volumes that document statistically the nearly complete failure of therapy. The statistics are awful. Uh, and in fact, they show that therapy probably most of the time makes things worse. In the process of therapy, wounds are exposed, but there's no healing. It would have been just like when I was a surgeon, uh, opening somebody up, finding the problem, and then going home. No, you, you actually have to finish the operation. You have to remove the tumor or uh, correct the anatomic problem and then sew the person back up. Or therapy puts people even more in their heads. Oh, some of the most difficult people I've ever talked to have been to the most therapy. As I'm talking to them about feeling loved, they scratch their chin in a Freudian fashion and describe the issues they have with this and with that and Oedipal complexes and I'm going, wow, no wonder life is confusing for you because you can just talk yourself to death inside your head. So no good being in your head. 
Read a couple of real love books, but don't get too involved in that because you can get all in your head with those too. Become a member of the Real Love site. Learn that. Learn there. Um, go to conference calls. Get a coach. Listen to what your coach tells you. Most important, your coach will help you feel. And that's what's going to heal your wounds. Not more thinking. Here's a woman who says, My sister and I are in business together, and until I found real love, we had a horrible time of it. I'll bet. You want to know real stress? Go into business with a family member or a friend. The expectations come out like crazy, because what they do is this. Um, when it comes to benefiting them, they want you to be a family member or a friend. Uh, when it comes to benefiting you, um, I think I just said it the other way around. They alternate back and forth. Um, when they want to take three weeks off with pay, then they want you to treat them like a family member. Um, when it comes to giving them, uh, to paying them for the work that they do or giving them vacations, they want you to behave like a family member. Uh, um, and when you come down and behave like an actual employer, um, then they're offended. So the expectations are horrible with family members and friends. Uh, you said now things are amazingly improved um, after learning more about real love, and I'll be introducing her to the principles of real love in the workplace uh, someday next month. Brave might be incredibly crazy of you, but brave. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. I'm not saying don't do it. No, I'm just saying interesting. Uh, we'll see. I would suggest that you introduce them, if you wish. I would suggest that you possibly that you not push them really hard on your first meeting. Uh, you say, so currently we don't discuss anything in real love terms. We have a one-hour business meeting every week, and that's all the time we spend together. This week I postponed our meeting until today because I was feeling ill and just too exhausted uh, to be relaxed and open with her. Well, brilliant on your part, genius. When you know that you're not filled up enough to spend time with someone, don't. You continue. However, she texted me just before today's meeting to say that she's been delayed doing a nasty job I know she hates and probably won't have eaten enough, as that is her usual pattern. In short, she'll be tired, hungry, and grumpy. But she asked me to still meet with her later in the day once she gets back, and she'd let me know when that time would be. And... I decided I won't be able to be loving enough to spend an hour with her today when she's feeling so low and tired and grumpy and irritable. And I think that's a loving thing to do for both of us. But I'm also aware that I can be controlling and take responsibility for other people's feelings. Am I missing something here? All you, don't worry about all that controlling and too much thinking in your head. All you care about is, do you, you, have the capacity to be loving with your sister, knowing that she's going to arrive grumpy and tired? That's, that's the question. It's the only question. If you don't, then you don't do it. Answers get so much easier when we ask the right questions and when we don't bring in too much extraneous information. <clears throat> here's a woman, or let's see, yeah, here's a guy who says, my wife tells me all day, uh, what is going through her mind. It is a constant stream of consciousness. Sometimes she just talks to herself out loud all day long. Um, it's difficult for me to figure out what is important to pay attention to. I thought of telling her that if what she is saying is noteworthy or if she wants a response from me, she should tell me. What do you think? Yeah, I think you should tell her to just put a label on all the things that she's saying. This one matters and this one doesn't. I'm joking. That would never work. Um, but there is an approach that would work. Consider two things. One, it's always about love. So you love her while, number two, preserving your own ability to love. Here's this topic again that keeps coming up. Loving as well as you can, in other words. So your wife talks all the time. That's her. Um, that's not a problem. That's just part of who she is, or possibly it's part of how she reacts to fear. At this point, we don't really care. You can't really ask her not to talk. I can't think of a way that you could say to your partner, would you mind shutting up for the next year or two? Mm, that won't come across as loving. 
So what is your role here? You make it so you can listen, which is loving, without exhausting yourself. Remember, one and two. Loving her, but preserving your own ability to love. Nobody can listen to another person all day long. Not really listen. I mean like, mm -hmm, listen to their soul, which is what real listening is. It's too exhausting, physically and emotionally. So you offer what you can. How would you do that? You have to talk to her very cleanly. If you need to practice this with a wise person, that would probably be a good idea. So you say something like this. It doesn't matter. The exact words don't matter. You say, I want to listen to you and love you. See how this is beginning? It's loving. I love you so much that I want to listen to you and do the very best I can to love you. But I can't do it all day. I'm just not good enough to do it all day. You talk to yourself sometimes and sometimes you talk to me and I can't tell the difference. No blaming. Uh, I'm not telling you to label it. Just saying, I can't tell. So, I need some help. If you're just talking to yourself, just jabbering, uh, and you're content with that, then I do have the energy to just kind of listen passively. Um, I'll just kind of be in the room, uh, being with you. Uh, while you talk, much like um, I enjoy it when I'm just watching a movie and Donna just sits next to me and I'm watching a movie. I just like having her there. She doesn't have to say a thing and I still like it. And my guess would be that your partner just likes you being in the room even if she's just jabbering to herself. But see, there are times she wants you to listen, you don't know the difference. So that that's when you say this last part. You say, if you want more attention, if you want me to actually be paying attention, then you need to be sure I'm, my eyes are looking at your eyes. So how would you like that to happen? You could signal me and say, look at me. Um, you could say, I need you to pay attention to me for a second. But see, if I'm looking at you while you're talking, then that would be a mutual agreement that what you're saying matters and I will listen with my full attention. But if our eyes are not locked, then I'll be giving you less diligent attention, though not entirely ignoring you. See? So now we have a method. Um, here's somebody who writes, I feel happier every day as I'm learning and growing. I'm doing better at work by doing what I'm told and not fighting to be right. It feels much better. This is somebody who had written to me about being right at work and being miserable. Uh, I'm looking for opportunities to push my comfort zone. For example, I often see my old manager in passing um, at her office and at our corporate office. That doesn't make sense entirely, but I noticed that each time I saw her, I reverted back to the old victim thoughts that she didn't like me and she didn't give me visits, uh, didn't give me work to do, so that she would essentially force me to quit. I didn't like the way that felt. And I realized the other day that I needed to do something. So that same day that I was going to be at her office for a meeting, I went to her and I asked to speak to her privately. She had a look of confusion as to why I wanted to talk to her. And she looked afraid of what might be coming. I told her that I said, when I worked here before, I had my own opinions on how things would work or how they should work. I was more interested in being right about my opinions than in being a team player. I told her I didn't make her job easy. In fact, I often made it more difficult for her and I was wrong. Honey, that is a lovely example of truth telling and being utterly disarming to somebody that you'd had previously a negative attitude about. So you chose to be loving and happy. This is great. She thanked me and made a couple of comments on how they probably did not handle things appropriately on her end either. Uh, I continued. I said, I don't need anything from you now. I just wanted to acknowledge how things would go, had gone. Uh, she said she was glad that I found a place that I was happy. Um, the short version, I'm going to shorten some of this. She said I, that she just acknowledged her part in being unkind to her boss. And she said her face and body relaxed. She chuckled and thanked me for talking to her. I wasn't afraid 
Um, I was comfortable. This is probably the first time I have stated that I was wrong so boldly outside of real love. It flowed. It felt good to end the conflict in my mind. Now when I see her, hopefully I'll remember I was wrong and not believe that I was ever victimized. This is an outstanding example of resolving a conflict, which this person did even though she'd moved away from that particular job because it was still a conflict in her head. And if you have a conflict even in your mind, it's preventing you from feeling loved and from being loving. So what a great example we have uh, of love and in this case, real love in the workplace. Just wonderful. So I really appreciate all of you sending in examples like this, examples of where things went brilliantly and you chose to be loving, examples of where you didn't because we learned from those, or simply questions of how you could be. What all these questions do is give us ways that we can find the love we're looking for, ways that we can trust it, and ways that we can remember it so that we can carry it around with us, heal our wounds, and choose to be happy all the time. I look forward to seeing you in a week.